Oh, thank you, Stenek, for the kind introduction and for inviting me here. Actually, I'm I'm a big fan of the scheduling seminar, and thanks for the the great talks we had in this series. And uh, yeah, it makes me proud to be in part of it. Uh, this, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's uh, switch to the topic scheduling in 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 the e-commerce era. And as you can imagine, with this title, it's compared to the other talks, a bit on the applied side. And I don't want to take a look at a single specific problem, but rather at a whole family of um, order fulfillment scheduling problems that uh, arise in a wide range of, of warehousing settings. But I will also come back to some theoretical stuff, but not uh, that much that, as you are used to. Okay, then uh, let's... Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry for the uh, delay. This was the slide I was expecting. Uh, yeah, let's start with my background. And uh, this dear old lady here, uh, this is uh, Jane Snowball. And uh, she is said to be uh, the first online shopper in the world. Actually, in 1984, she ordered groceries at her local Tesco store in Gateshead in the UK via the telephone and um, yeah, the display uh, of the offers was on, on the television set. And um, yeah, 40 years have passed since then. And um, yeah, I don't tell any big secrets to you that since then a tremendous development in e-commerce and online sales uh, has taken place. I don't want to bore you with, an, with the numbers here uh, that everybody knows. So let's take a look at the warehouses, which has also have also evolved tremendously uh, in parallel because they have to um, deliver all these orders. I can still remember uh, times during my own studies when I still played handball, um, there I had to earn some money and worked in such a traditional warehouse. And um, yeah, the, the main challenge of the day was also to, to cope with the boredom and, and with a feet ache at the end of the day. So these traditional warehouses, these picker to parts warehouses have not much in common uh, nowadays with uh, modern e-commerce fulfillment factories where every single process step is closely monitored and, and optimized. And this tremendous development in the distribution centers comes along with a switch from um, picker to parts warehouses, where the pickers, the human pickers walk through the warehouse and, and visit the storage locations where the items that are demanded are stored at, to parts to picker warehouses. Here, it's just rather the items that, that come to a stationary picker by machinery and obviously, this saves a lot of unproductive uh, walking. And therefore, we see an increasing switch towards uh, these parts to picker system. Although it's not entirely true that no uh, picker to parts warehouses uh, are any longer applied in e-commerce warehouses, they are still also very common too, because they have a big asset, because they are very, very flexible. If you have a workload peak before Black Friday or a single stay in China, then you just add additional workers and then you can you are very flexible to, to adapt to workload uh, changes. That's not that easy in these parts to picker system because they are based on a lot of machinery, um, but still they are more efficient. And yeah, I will talk on these uh, parts to picker warehouses and the scheduling problems that, that arise here. So let's take a look at the basic process of uh, parts to picker systems. It starts with an automated storage and retrieval system in so-called ASRS, where all the stuff is, is stored. So we have the stock keeping units, the SKUs. They are um, stored in bins uh, and the most widespread ASRS is certainly such a high bay rack, which is operated by an automated crane. But there are also other um, Older systems like these carousel racks, which where the complete rack turns around and uh, then at the front of the, uh, the system, you can obtain some bins. 
But there are also other systems here, uh, like these uh, lift and shuttle systems, where the horizontal movement is done by these shuttles. And at the at the start of an aisle, you have a lift that transports the bins to to some input output station. And the the biggest success of the the last years is these auto store systems, where you have a metal frame on which autonomous robots drive, and they have an access mechanism to access these shafts. And in these shafts, bins are piled up. And they always can obtain the topmost bin and then bring it to some input output station. And independent of what specific system we have, once the bin has reached an input output point, we have a conveying system that delivers the bins toward a picking workstation. We can see right here. This is where this, the skew bin with the, with the products arrives. And here on the outer side, we see different customer bins where the orders are collected. And once the SKU bin has arrived here, we see a light display uh, that indicates the orders which have to obtain the, the current SKU and also the number of items. And then the picker puts the stuff in. And these modern picking workstations, they typically also have a weighing mechanism um, that to, to rule out picking errors. And once the current SKU is done, then um, the SKU bin returns uh, into the ASRS and the next SKU bin visits here. And in this way, the process proceeds until some order is ready. Then it is automatically delivered uh, onwards to the shipping area and a new empty bin for the next order is loaded into the station. And we can see here, because we have many slots for, for a lot of um, customer orders, um, if we achieve that many of these orders share a lot of SKUs, then we can save um, SKU bin visits at this workstation. And this relieves the whole system. And this is what um, order fulfillment scheduling problems I want to talk about today are all about, to achieve some kind of synchronization between um, the, the SKU bins and the customer bins so uh, that we have an efficient process. So now that you've got a broad idea of what I want to talk about, let's come to the agenda of the talk. So at first, I want to speak or define what order fulfillment scheduling problems are. And I want to make a comparison with um, traditional machine scheduling. And then I come up with a classification scheme because depending on the, on the workstation setup, we have a lot of very similar order fulfillment scheduling problems. And I want to, to bring some order uh, into this uh, mess to derive a classification scheme. I will just roughly sketch it to not bore you too much with uh, too many uh, tuples and differentiation of attributes. And once we have this, I want to go through four examples where I elaborate the warehousing setup of the workstation, define the order fulfillment problem, and, and um, present you some selected results. Yeah, and then we are done, and I try an outlook on how um, yeah, order fulfillment in e-commerce will look uh, like in five to 10 years. So let's start um, with the relation of machine scheduling and order fulfillment scheduling. So we have traditional machine scheduling and here our order fulfillment scheduling happening in these uh, picking workstation. And at first we have something in common because both constitute an input output process. In machine scheduling, the input is jobs. We feed into the machine, um, then this machine or a human uh, proce processor um, does something, adds parts and, and the output is a product. And it's quite similar in order fulfillment scheduling. We also have an input, which is skew bins that arrive at this workstation. And then the picker does something with this input because uh, he obtains uh, items and puts it into order bins, into customer orders. And um, this is the output of our process. So now let's come to a difference which is the relation uh, among input and output. In machine scheduling, the typical relation is a one-to-one -one relation. We feed one job in and receive one product, especially in single machine and parallel machine scheduling. This is typically the case. But we also have job shop and flow shop and open shop uh, scheduling where we have a one-to-n relationship where uh, we have to go through multiple jobs to finally obtain a product. In order fulfillment scheduling, 
we rather have an n to m relationship because each skew bin which delivers a specific skew this skew can be demanded by a lot of orders and each single order can also demand a lot of skews so we have an n to n relationship here which is a bit different from traditional machine scheduling and furthermore we see here we have some parallel batching this must not only be like in this picture um, parallel um, customer bins but can also be um, parallel uh, skew bins as we will see but um, we always have some parallel batching in the typical case in machine scheduling this is not the case there is just one job per machine at a time but of course Parallel batching is quite a uh, renowned and widespread extension of, of machine scheduling, where you also can uh, produce a, a larger batch of, of jobs in parallel as long as the, the batch capacity is not exceeded. So we borrow this parallel batching here from traditional machine scheduling. And our final objective is to receive some kind of synchronization be between the SKU bins streaming into the system and the customer bins where we collect the orders um, moving out of the system as output. So to give you an even better idea on the specific scheduling problem problems that arise here, let's have a look at a specific order fulfillment scheduling problem for this uh, specific workstation you see right here. Again, in the middle, there is one skew bin, and on the outer hand, there are two customer bins where the orders are collected. And here, is a view on this um, system from a side. We have a work batch capacity for two customer orders and one skew bin arrives at a time. And if we have to satisfy four orders here, we have to select um, two of them, which are the ones we start with. And here it's those that demand SKU A and C. And here the other order it just demands C. And therefore two orders demand a stock keeping unit C. So it may be a good idea to start with this SKU, and then uh, we can directly satisfy this demand of this order. Here, C is the only item uh, required so that this order is directly done, and the next order uh, can move in with the demand for A, B. And then it may be a good idea to let SKU A visit the system so that this order is done. The next one can move up, and this order too demands SKU A, so we do not have to let the SKU bin revisit the system. We can still satisfy this demand uh, with the same bin that is already there. And here it's uh, A that is um, satisfied. And this, um, yeah, the remaining items are just B and D. We have to let them visit uh, subsequently, of course, and then we are done with our four orders. So in this example, we see that um, four skew bin visits are uh, sufficient to um, satisfy our orders, to fulfill them here. Here's another uh, solution, an alternative solution, where we slightly alter the sequence in which we um, process the orders and the sequence in which we let the skew bins uh, visit the system. And we see that we demand one, two, three, four, five uh, bins here. And uh, the number of skew bins that have to visit such a system is a good proxy uh, for an efficient um, order fulfillment process. Because on the one hand, uh, the fewer bins that need to visit the workstation means less workload for the automated storage and retrieval system. And the expensive part of such a picker to part system is mostly the ASRS, the automated storage and retrieval system, because it's a huge system with a lot of machinery. Uh, this is often the bottleneck. And the fewer bins we um, have to deliver, the lower the workload of this bottleneck system. And furthermore, also the picking process gets, gets accelerated. The fewer bins uh, have to visit the workstation because associated with each um, SKU bin is typically a small setup time. The new bin has to move in, the old one has to move out, and then uh, the lights have to flash to the picker has to get oriented. And um, with any bin visit, uh, there is a small delay in the setup time, which we can save if we minimize the number of orders. So that obviously this solution A is the one to be preferred uh, right here. So I hope now you get a, a rough idea on, on order fulfillment uh, scheduling. 
And um, yeah, let me introduce that there is quite a lot of variation, slightly different uh, problem setups uh, with different uh, workstations. So I come to a classification scheme, a typical uh, three field notation um, inspired by the Graham et al notation for machine scheduling, where alpha represents the inbound stream of uh, skew bins that visit the workstation. Beta is the, the customer bins that flow out of the system filled with the uh, demanded items. And we have gamma, the objective. And let's start with um, wrong direction. Let's start um, with the first, <laughs> oh, sorry. Let's start um, with the first attribute, which is the capacity for parallel skew bins. And here in the system, we see the default case, it's just one SKU bin at a time. But you see that there are also other workstation setups where we have a lot of uh, SKU bins loaded in here that service a lot of um, customer bins here. It's four at a time. So there are also uh, different um, setups and this is differentiated right here. Then the next thing I want to look, take a look at is the bin composition. Uh, many systems have uh, homogeneous skew bins where it's always the same item which is stuck in there. But there are also other systems um, where we see a wide range of different skews. Then we have uh, heterogeneous uh, bins and uh, there are already uh, also systems where the bins are not, not even bins actually, uh, but these inventory pods. So workstation need not be fed by a conveyor belt, like in our example, but it can also be these Kiva robots, uh, these autonomous robots, which have a lifting uh, mechanism that drive below a rack, lift the inventory pod and deliver it to um, our stationary picker in his workstation. So we can have a completely different um, physical process right here, a completely different workstation setup. Uh, but from a modeling perspective, uh, the only difference we have is that these bins right here um, contain a wide range of different uh, stock keeping units where uh, these are um, homogeneous. Here are further um, attributes. The, the arrival sequence of the SKU bins can be fixed or part of the optimization. And um, here's a differentiation whether we have to um, keep track of the, the bin inventory. Typically in e-commerce, we rather have very small orders. The typical household uh, at Amazon Germany, for instance, orders just 1.6 items per order, so that the vast majority, or typically over 90%, is just um, orders for a single uh, SKU, so-called one SKU orders. And um, yeah, with these small orders, um, the inventory in any bin is typically sufficient so that we do, do not have to uh, keep track of the inventory in a bin. It's just sufficient that if a specific skew is in a bin, then it's always uh, sufficient to satisfy the demand, which is our default case um, to keep the problem as basic as possible. Okay, let's have a look at the, uh, the better tuple, the outbound side. And again, we have uh, a different capacity for parallel customer bins. Here we see the most basic workstation setup is just exactly to the right hand of this uh, um, female uh, skew bin. And on the left hand, it's a single uh, skew bin. So this is an option. But here we see a put to light system where we have a lot of uh, um, customer bins. So many actually that um, she needs a roller conveyor here to move along with the stock keeping units uh, with the skew bin. And then you have a light mechanism that indicates which of these uh, orders demand this uh, current skew. So there are also systems which have a lot of parallel uh, customer bids. Another, uh, let's skip the other uh, attributes here. And let's take a look at an important one, which is whether we have a fast um, bin exchange. Once a, a customer bin is completed, here we have an automated mechanism that is very fast to remove the filled bin and load a new empty bin. And this mechanism is actually so fast that the next new order can still receive uh, the current SKU bin. In such a process here, 
um, we don't have such a, a fast automated um, um, process for exchanging the bins. It's rather once she places the final item here into this order, then a light switches on, she moves onward and another logistics worker has to access this order because it's finished and move it onward to, to the shipping area. And once this is done, she is long gone uh, so that the next order cannot receive uh, the SKU bin that has just passed. And it has to revisit the station at a later time to um, fulfill the demand. So this is another important uh, differentiation. Ah, this finally leads us to the objective. And of course, we can apply any traditional objective of machine scheduling, um, only just related to the completion of the orders or the make span of completing all orders. Um, E-commerce is especially at, at last, large retailers like uh, Amazon is, is a bit uh, special so that typically no due date or deadline related objectives make a lot of sense because if you have a vast pool of orders you have to process, you select the most urgent ones which have to be at the customers within the next hours or uh, at the latest at the next day. So you have uh, all of the orders of the waves you're processing and you seek a schedule for are basically urgent so that there is not a huge difference among their uh, due dates and deadlines. So um, I, these, nonetheless, there are warehouses where these traditional machine scheduling uh, objectives are valid. Um, I've not seen much uh, research on that. So maybe this is an option for uh, people seeking a, a nice uh, research task. But I want to concentrate on, on our proxy we had in the example, where we just aim to minimize the number of SKU bins that have to visit the system to fulfill all uh, orders. And as I said, this reduces the setup times for the pickers, and this reduces the workload for the ASRs because fewer bins uh, have to be delivered toward the workstation. And this relieves what is typically the, the, the bottleneck in, in, in such a process. So this should be a good proxy for an efficient um, uh, process. And of course, just counting the number of bins, uh, we receive a very basic objective and a very uh, basic uh, family of order fulfillment scheduling problems. But there are many, many extensions beyond this classification where further work is required. OK. Now we have this classification and we can take a look at the existing literature and it, you see it's not that much. Um, there are some cases that have already been investigated. And when we take a look at this um, application column, we see or we can imagine uh, by um, listing these uh, different applications that up to now um, these fields are all investigate the sp specific cases without the awareness that very similar uh, problems for maybe completely different warehousing setups have already uh, been investigated. So that's just a good reason why I think such a more general view on the whole class of uh, order fulfillment and scheduling problems uh, is required. And what I really think is amazing is that um, a case of our um, classification uh, occurs for a completely different uh, system, uh, paint shop batching in the automotive industry. Um, actually, uh, Nicole Mego, um, when I gave one of the very first talks years ago on this topic, uh, she pointed out and she gave a very nice uh, talk um, in this scheduling seminar series, by the way. So Nicole, uh, if you are out there, thank you for uh, your tip on the paint shop batching problem. Um, so there are problems from completely different uh, domain, which um, are also relevant in this area. Okay, let's take a look at, at specific cases uh, of this classification scheme and, and let me elaborate a bit on the, uh, the workstation setups and some theoretical results. So here uh, we again meet our example and I don't want to go through uh, my, my example once again, I just wanted to show you uh, the notation in the classification scheme of this uh, specific setup. The main um, thing here is the fast bin exchange so that an order 
which uh, takes over the place of a just completed one can still receive uh, the current skew bin. And this feature um, taking uh, this fast um, bin exchange is also used to show um, that um, the resulting order fulfillment problem of this basic case is actually uh, strongly NP-hard and a complexity proof. And uh, even if we just have a capacity for a single customer order at a time. And the reduction is from the Hamiltonian path problem where we just seek, uh, where we have a graph and we just seek a path uh, that visits uh, each node exactly once. Um, um, and here is a solution for this, what is obviously a yes instance. And uh, given this uh, Hamiltonian path uh, problem instance, uh, the transformation scheme um, in which we generate an instance of our um, order fulfillment problem right here is pretty straightforward. Each node um, represents an order and this specific node here has three outgoing uh, edges and each edge represents a stock keeping unit. So ABC is here in one. So these are the stock keeping units required by this order. And we also have just a capacity for one um, customer uh, bin at a time in our workstation. Therefore, basically any stock keeping unit, any bin uh, with SKUs demanded by any order has to visit the station. So if we start with uh, order two, then all demanded uh, SKUs have to visit the station. And if we start with D and then, then have A, and then switch to order one, who also, uh, which also demands A, then we have our fast bin exchange uh, here so that we save uh, a visit of the SKU bin and can, can uh, still satisfy order, order one with the bin that is currently there at the station. So whenever we switch among orders um, with a SKU that is shared by them, then we save a visit of the stock keeping unit. So the question we ask, is there a solution where we can save n minus one uh, visits of the stock uh, keeping uh, units of the, the SKU bins and actually uh, moving, switching bins here from A to A equals uh, moving along this edge. So whenever we save a bin by switching here, it is directly uh, equivalent to using uh, this particular path so that we have a one-to-one -one mapping between these two problems. I hope you got the rough idea of, of this proof. And this leads us um, yeah, to the next setup, which um, yeah, has on first hand nothing to do with our order fulfillment stuff because it's from automotive production. So this is um, the classification of this problem. We have a sequence of cars. The sequence is fixed and approaches um, a, a random access bus buffer. So in our classification, we have a fixed uh, inbound sequence of, uh, of cars here. And uh, we have a random access buffer and um, the cars, they move into this buffer according to uh, this given sequence. And Behind this buffer, we have a paint shop, and this has to be set up to a specific color. And now we could start with blue, then we obtain um, the car, the blue cars from the random access buffer, and the cars next in, in line move up. Unfortunately, it's no further car, blue car then uh, available, so that we have to switch color right here. So we could switch to the uh, red car, and then uh, finally to the, uh, the yellow car. And therefore we have a solution um, with just two setup operations right here. And actually for this problem from production domain, there's a direct counterpart for our order fulfillment for a specific type of workstation. So this is our problem from paint shop batching and the sequence of cars, each demanding a specific color, they are just equal to a given sequence of customer orders. We also have already have decided on the sequence uh, of customer orders we want to satisfy, maybe uh, according to their uh, customer value. Um, but the cars, they just demand a single color. 
So our orders also demand a single skew. This is a one skew order where each order demands just a single skew. As I already told you, um, B2C customers, customer households tend to uh, demand just a few items. So the vast majority of, of orders in e-commerce just demand a single item. And we only have these items right here. They approach the random access buffer and the random access buffer is just equal to a wor workstation with uh, parallel slots for customer bins. And the paint shop with its setups just equals um, to the SKU bins that are loaded into the system so that each new SKU uh, and its color, um, e um, each new SKU resembles the color of a specific car that can be painted. So we have a direct correspondence between this paint shop batching problem and a sensible workstation setup and the resulting order fulfillment problem. And this is good news. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just can uh, rely on existing research. And uh, yeah, here's Nicole's paper. Um, and um, yeah, existing research has already proven uh, NP hardness for, for this paint shop batching problem and therefore also for our uh, order fulfillment problem. Okay, let's move on um, to another problem, this uh, put to light order picking system. This is the classification scheme, which basically just removes the fast bin exchange. Here's the setup from the bird's eye view. We have our ASR system delivering skew bins. And here on the outer hand, we have a lot of customer bins and the picker walks along this conveyor, roller conveyor, and wherever demand is indicated by a light signal, uh, she puts the stuff in and then proceeds with the next skew bin and so on. And here uh, we do not have a fast uh, bin exchange mechanism. So if we just have a single slot for a single uh, customer order, then um, uh, we don't have this fast bin exchange available to, to prove and be hardness so that we have to come up uh, with uh, another proof in a second. Here is just another example where we can see that even if we don't have the possibility to, to use the fast bin exchange uh, mechanism, even if this is not given different um, sequences in which we load the customer bins into our um, put to light pick face and in which we process the skew bins lead to um, better processes here. Here we just demand uh, four customer bins, uh, four skew bins, and here it's five skew bins. So that this solution is actually better. And um, I think you get the idea uh, without me having to uh, take a de detailed look at this example. Instead, I wanted to uh, give you a complexity proof because the previous one no longer works. This relied on the fast bin exchange. But um, if this is removed and we have just a single uh, slot for a customer uh, for, for customer orders, um, every uh, skew bin has to visit the system. There is no possibility to save it. Therefore, we need a new proof where at least uh, two uh, customer bins are loaded in, in the system. And to do so, uh, our reduction is from the minimum cut linear arrangement problem where we have a graph and these uh, this is just labels to identify uh, the edges. It's no, no weight. And uh, we have an additional integer um, K in, in an instance. And here you see a solution because we just seek vertex labels, which uh, assign an index from one to N to each of these nodes. If we span the edges um, between um, the respective nodes, so if we play C here and D here, then uh, this arc goes from here, from the first to the third um, sequence position. And if we have C and B here, uh, where there is an edge, then it just remains here. And now if we um, cut before or after one of these uh, labeled uh, vertices, then we see that our integer K is never exceeded. So again, we have a yes instance of a minimum cut linear arrangement. And now the transformation scheme, now it's the other way around. Now an edge represents an order and the adjacent um, 
nodes um, are the skews that are contained in these this order. So one edge one here constitutes order one in which a stock keeping units A and B are required. And now our sequence uh, of vertices equals uh, the sequence in which the stock keeping units uh, arrive at the system. And we seek a solution where any stock keeping unit must visit the system only once. And if we have this solution right here, then we see, okay, it's C and D is required by order four. So this spans from here to here, these uh, visits of the stock keeping units, whereas C and B is here. So that order two just remains for these two, two slots in the system. And during the whole time, we see that we do not exceed our capacity for customer bins of, of two slots. So that again, we have a direct correspondence uh, between uh, both uh, problems and um, this classification, this uh, tuple of the classification also turns out as a complex problem. Okay, let's move onward um, to these shelf lifting robots, uh, mobile robots. I already told you about these uh, robots that can lift the inventory parts. And although the outer uh, appearance of the systems is completely different uh, to the previous ones, it fits perfectly well to our order fulfillment problems because it's the only difference here is just instead of a conveyor, we have uh, uh, the, the bin delivery here, it's inventory parts by these robots, which deliver one at a time and add them to this queue. But one is always uh, first and here in the back of the picker, there is this workstation where we see different bins where the customer orders are collected. So basically not a huge difference right here, although the outer experience is com appearance is completely different. Of course, order fulfillment scheduling is not the only problem you have with such a system. Uh, there's a complete uh, hierarchy, but order fulfillment scheduling is one prominent part of this hierarchy. It starts with order selection and assignment, because typically you, you do not just have a single workstation, but dozens of them. And therefore you have to select the next orders you want to process and assign them, partition them among the available workstations. And once this decision is done, then you have a specific order set for your specific workstation. And then you have to sequence uh, um, the orders and you have to sequence uh, the inventory pot deliveries, which is the task of order fulfillment scheduling. So this is our part, but afterwards um, you're done with a specific rack. It has to, the inventory pot has to return into the, the storage area. And there you have to select uh, a specific position where frequently demanded racks uh, are prominently stored so that they do, do not have uh, such a long way to their next uh, workstation. And finally, um, you have to identify a specific robot that transports um, uh, an inventory pot uh, from A to B, and you have to take care during path planning that there are no de deadlocks and everything uh, works fine. We want to take a look at order fulfillment scheduling, and um, yeah, it should not surprise you that, again, we have a very uh, similar uh, problem here. This is the notation in our classification. And the only difference is here that each bin, although it's inventory parts in, in this uh, system right here, does not contain only a single stock keeping unit, but a mix of them. So this is basically the difference in this um, example too, which allows us to, to here have a way more efficient process where we just have three visits of these racks instead of four, like it is done in uh, this example. Um, unfortunately, already when decomposing the problem, which is what we did uh, when we uh, solved this problem, we uh, took a look what happens to the problem if we fix the order sequence and just minimize the number uh, of the, the racks that visit the system, the inventory parts to satisfy the given order sequence. Unfortunately, the re remaining problem is still strongly NP hard. And also the other way around, if we um, optimize order sequencing for a given sequence of inventory parts, this problem is, is hard too. 
Nonetheless, we uh, devise, uh, derived a solution procedure solving each problem, and then uh, we, we solved it in, in an interchanging manner until uh, the solution could not be improved. But uh, I don't want to talk about uh, solution procedures uh, today, and I don't even want to, to go into details of this complexity proof. Instead, I wanted to show you some results of our generalized view on the whole class of problems. Applying our classification scheme gives a total of, uh, by, by, by combining all the attributes, um, delivers 576 uh, problems. You just have to remove a few uh, attributes, uh, problem settings where attributes do not fit together. And then by finding hierarchies among, um, uh, <clears throat> among attributes, we were able to show that 281 of these problems are strongly NP-hard. And for another 156 problems, uh, we were able to show that they are solvable in polynomial time. If you take a quick look at uh, what has to happen to this problem, then you see basically you have to have one skew orders where it's just one skew per, per order. And you have to either have to fix the sequence of the skew bins or the sequence of customer bins, or even both, to obtain a problem that is solvable in polynomial time. Nonetheless, there is still a gap of uh, 139 problems, if I counted correctly. And so there is still some work. And this is just the basic classification. Beyond our classification, there are further objectives, further side constraints, so that there is still this actual group of order, uh, order fulfillment problems is way larger and there's still a lot of work um, to be done. Before I come to, to an end of my talk, I want to give a brief glance onto some managerial results because now that we have this nice classification scheme, we could also answer some managerial questions regarding what is the best setup of a workstation. And to, to um, yeah, answer this question, we have our basic case, which is just the basic case of our classification. Um, and then we can take uh, an order, uh, an, an instance of our uh, an order set and just uh, optimize, derive the optimal solution for this uh, basic case of our classification and determine the number of skew bins that have to visit. And now we can extend our workbench. This delivers us uh, more complex cases in our classification where we either have more uh, skew bins or more um, customer bins or a fast uh, bin exchange mechanism and take the same uh, instances and solve it with the new workstation setup and see how many uh, skew bin visits we can save. And in this table here, a negative number of uh, almost 25 uh, indicates that we can save 25% of skew bin visits if we switch from the basic uh, setup, uh, where we just, just have one skew bin and one um, customer bin at a time, to a system where we have three um, skew bins uh, that can be um, processed in parallel. So the first question we want to take a look at is how many bins should we have? Is it, is it a good idea to have more bins? And we see here, yes, it is, because we see a huge improvement if we start with just one bin or have many customer bins. We reduce uh, here with five parallel uh, customer bins, we reduce by more than 50%. Or here, uh, it's, it's the same if we have multiple parallel uh, skew bins. So yes, we should have uh, definitely have uh, more skew bins or more customer bins. But what we can see too is that when we go from one uh, bin to three bins, uh, the improvement is way larger than going from three to five. And if we go beyond five, then um, the further improvement is is not very uh, is not tremendously large. So we see that the positive gains of more bins quickly diminishes. And this is good news because the more bins we have in this direction here, the larger is the walking effort of the picker and the farther he has to, to walk, obviously the less efficient um, uh, will be 
um, the process, there will be a loss uh, due to the, the travel along the pig phase. So it's good news that five bins works tremendously fine, but there's no need to go beyond that. Uh, then the next question we could answer, is it better to have more skew bins or customer bins? Uh, it doesn't matter. We see that there is a slight difference, but it's not uh, statistically significant. And if we take a look at uh, these numbers here, it's another uh, data set where all um, skews appear uh, with the equal um, probability in each order. Here we have a typical ABC um, logic where we have a very few fast moving A items and a lot of slow moving C items. And there we see um, here that it reverts. Here it's better to have more customer bins. Here it's better to have more SKU bins. But in our data set, there's not a huge difference among them. So we could invest into both whatever is easier. Then the next question we want to take a look at is, should we mix our SKU bins? And then we have to compare these numbers. It's always, when we follow the, the arrows, it's always the same workstation setup with five parallel um, customer bins, only we add uh, a mix of SKUs. And we see that the improvement is just about 3%. Uh, here it's about eight and here it's about eight. It's not that, um, significantly large. And we have to uh, keep in mind that if we mix our skew bins, there's always additional search effort uh, for the picker. Um, and if we have a lot of uh, skews in our inventory parts, it takes the picker sufficient time to, to find the right, uh, the de demanded skew, so that this slows down the process. And if we count this in, which is what is not done in our experiments, but we see that even without the search effort, the, the gains we have are not significantly large. So um, that um, yeah, including the search effort, it's probably not worth the effort. Okay, then yeah, yeah there are some, some stuff what you can do in a, in, a, in a warehouse. Typically they display the specific stock keeping unit you want to have at a, a, at a display and uh, Amazon applies a laser beam that indicates the compartment where the specific demanded SKU is stored in an inventory bin, but still you have some search effort. Okay, this is the final managerial result is the question, should we have a fast switching mechanism? And there we see if we just have a single bin, customer bin, then having a fast um, bin interchange so that the next, uh, skew, uh, the next customer bin can reapply uh, the current uh, stock keeping unit, there we see a huge improvement of more than 20%. But if we already have quite a few number of bins, then this positive effect decreases. So we can say that, yes, you, we could invest into a fast bin uh, exchange mechanism, but only if there is no option for us to have additional bins. If we have them, there's no need for a fast uh, bin exchange mechanism because a fast bin exchange is basically the same result as an additional bin. Okay, this was some managerial results and this already leads me to my um, conclusion. What I wanted to show you is that although we have quite different setup of the warehouses, the workstations right here, uh, we always meet a very similar kind of scheduling problem, these order fulfillment problems. And as I said, I already showed you the very basic classification. It was already 576 problems, but beyond that, there are still many more. And one reason for my talk was to advertise this, this uh, type of research because there are not many people working on that and it's, it's highly relevant in, in warehousing practices. So, uh, maybe um, I could inspire uh, some, some of you. Now I promised an outlook on how uh, the future of e-commerce uh, retailing and order fulfillment will, will look like. And my projection, my forecast is that in five to 10 years, we will have fully automated uh, fulfillment factories, also in e-commerce. There are already fully automated warehouses, but not in e-commerce. Remember the order structure, I already told you that in e-commerce, we just have one or two items that are demanded of each stock keeping unit because the customer households do not 
uh, order a lot. And this always requires a grip into a bin. And this is always hard to automate. Uh, where we ha already have fully automated warehouses is uh, in warehouses that satisfy store orders. They have a larger demand. And then you can say, yeah, 12 mil crates, they form a case and the case is rectangular and rectangular cases can very well uh, be automated. So there we already have fully automated warehouses, but uh, for e-commerce, uh, we always have to, to grip into the bin. And this is still hard, a challenge for, for, for um, automization. Huge progress has been made, but it's still hard to meet um, the performance of human pickers. So these vacuum grippers, they're quite good and they will further improve. So maybe it takes another five to 10 years and then we have the fully automated uh, uh, warehouse, even in e-commerce. Um, this may be bad news for the people working there who have their jobs in this area, but definitely not for operations researchers because uh, it doesn't matter if we have a human who needs advice or a machine. Robots uh, have to have advice in which order to sequence uh, the customer bins too. So uh, we will still have work even if uh, we have the, the fully automated uh, factory, maybe even more because humans take their own decisions and machines cannot do without advice. So uh, yeah, for operations researcher, it's excellent use. And maybe this is another reason for, for you to, to enter this field of research. Finally, here's a reference to the, the papers. Um, this talk um, gave the, the content. And finally, it's, it's an opportunity to thank all my, my uh, brilliant co-authors. Um, it's, it's their work I presented here and it took them uh, plenty of time to, to explain everything to me. So thank you guys for, 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 for the joint work. And yeah, thank you all for, for joining it. And um, yeah, let's see whether there are some questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I allowed all the spectators to ask the questions so they can unmute themselves. Uh, so please go ahead if you want to just ask. Can I ask a question? Sure. Hello, Jarkar. Yes. Oh, okay. Niels, thank you very much. This is a very applied talk and, and I like it. These are important problems. And at the same time, you uh, follow the old line of, of classification and complexity. So thank you very much for keeping this alive. Uh, I, I have a question. Your uh, complexity results, you mentioned uh, NP, NP hardness in a strong sense, and you mentioned polynomial time solvability. Did you also encounter cases where uh, you could only prove uh, ordinary NP completeness or uh, pseudo polynomial time complexity? No, no binary NP hardness we were able to detect. Probably it's uh, hidden in the 139 cases uh, we could okay. not find. Um... Okay, thank you. Nice work. Okay, so anybody else? If not for the moment, I can ask also, but these problems are not just offline optimization problems, right? There are also online optimization problems because orders are maybe coming progressively or or do we feel a sufficient time to say, for example, now we are doing an order for one specific hour and then we will have something left and we will do it for the next hour or... Um, this, this is an excellent question. Uh, there are, uh, we are in e-commerce and of course e-commerce orders are, orders are notoriously uh, urgent. Dynamic, so, yeah. um, but uh, as I said, it, it's a, a bit of a different, if we, uh, our warehouse is actually directly in the city center and we have to service very urgent orders in the next half hour or in, in, in the next uh, next hour, then there are, is an online problem where new orders come in and we have to solve it in an, in an online way. With these huge um, Amazon warehouses, which are rather outside the city centers, they typically process in, in waves. They have a huge order pool and they identify uh, the next orders of the next wave. And then it rather becomes uh, a somehow uh, static deterministic problem. Of course, it can always happen something that, that a robot uh, has a failure and does not appear and then you have to react. Um, but there, uh, this assumption of, of deterministic static cases is, is more, more realistic. Um, yeah, but... 
we all know that even if we have a dynamic problem, still uh, the static case is nice to, to uh, identify and solve uh, because we can somehow reapply the methods there to also address the more complex uh, dynamic problems. Okay, thank you. I will ask the second question, and that's about when I see so many problems, like 500 problems, and I imagine that there will be one specific fine-tuned algorithm for each of these 500 problems, right? It is nice that we will have opportunity to write a lot of papers, but for practitioners, it's not that useful, right? Because I imagine that in practice, maybe sometimes you have even hybrid problems that you combine several cases together and so on. Right? So do you think that any like generic um, a generic way of solving combinatorial problems, for example, constraint programming or whatever, uh, can be uh, good here, but, but we know that it's hard to have uh, good solutions for large problems and problems here are large. And so, so maybe some decomposition into picker. So uh, is there any way how to handle it a bit more systematically, like to tackle more problems at once and still have performance? Uh, I still have performance. I think a classification scheme is a, is a nice to have uh, asset for, for that, because uh, if you have a hierarchy among problems, then solve the most complex one. And then you can obviously also solve uh, the the problems with, which are hierarchically on a on a lower level. Um, but if it's a very general problem, then you already mentioned it. Uh, you get trouble um, with the efficiency, or you you lose special structure you can utilize in these uh, uh, problems. Um, yeah, this is uh, an interesting field of research, uh, definitely. Um, and it's always hard to, on the one hand, you want to generalize to solve a broader range of problems. On the one hand, you lose uh, special problem structure. Um, you have to, uh, uh, you can utilize, um, yeah, the guy who resolved this trade-off uh, finally uh, is uh, probably very renowned in our community. Okay, so that will be for a Nobel Prize if there ever was a Nobel Prize in scheduling. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, <laughs> so if you if you open a chat, uh, you can uh, read the question which appeared there. Uh, no, I'm lost in space here. At the on moment. the bottom, you should see uh, like chat. Just click on it. I should. Uh, um, uh, chat there. Yeah. Uh, about slice twenty one. Give the hierarchy of plane. Yeah. Can you can you read it? Because maybe the others um, don't yeah. see it. Willem Heinz asks, I have a question about slide 21. Given the hierarchy of planning there, is replanning of, for example, the OFS given by the result of rack assignment planning or robot assignment and path thing used in praxis as well? Or is it just one forward pass for the higher hierarchy to the lower one? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. Um, yeah, Maybe, may I ask you to go to slide uh, 21 so that we, we see what was... Uh, yeah, this is an excellent uh, idea. It's about this uh, hierarchy. Yeah, of course, there is a lot of research in this area. And um, decomposing all these problems into isolated steps is nice to have and just handing them uh, in a hierarchical manner from one to the next. But of course, there is also research on combining this. For instance, order selection and assignment with order fulfillment so that we have many workstations and including that uh, there's a lot of research going on uh, to have more holistic problems where uh, you involve many of these uh, hierarchical steps. But still, I think um, investigating the basics of each single step is also uh, worthwhile because, uh, yeah, we all know that solving a more holistic problem, decomposition is always a good idea. And if we, even if we want to solve uh, the complete planning hierarchy, then having strong workhorses as building blocks, uh, efficient building blocks for single problems is always nice to have. So I think um, there is reason for research in, in, in both areas. And if you are interested on the planning hierarchy applied by Amazon, there was a recent um, 
uh, paper of the guys uh, optimizing these uh, um, algorithms for Amazon in what was former informs uh, interfaces, interfaces, this info journal, I don't know, I forgot uh, how it got renamed in the recent years. They published in 2022, they published uh, a paper on how it is done at, at Amazon. So this is very interesting. And there you can learn how, how they uh, address the whole uh, hierarchy. Okay, there is another question from YouTube channel. If you can do the same. Uh, yeah, uh, Boris Tandogan asks, I want to ask a question about the 1.6 average from 2018. Could that have changed in the meantime, significantly considering Amazon is much more popular, especially in Germany? Uh, thank you for the explanation. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, um, they, of course, I think people still order just a few items. Um, I don't know if this has changed since uh, 2018. Um, of course, they try uh, if if people order at the same day multiple times nowadays, they uh, try to to unify that, and and this leads to to larger orders. So this could be a reason why they have uh, larger orders. But all there are a lot of um, um, order sets from from industry from e-commerce, uh, downloadable on Kaggle and uh, all these uh, platforms. And, and there, it is pretty uh, obvious that this more than 90% of one SKU orders uh, has not changed significantly. So I don't think that there is a, a, a huge difference nowadays. It's a little bit scary from ecological point of view that we are ordering by one item and there is somebody who needs to transport it, right? Yeah, but that's the question. Um, they still consolidate. And if the whole neighborhood receives something, it doesn't matter to have a, uh, a stop in the same street uh, once again. The alternative is that each, each household uh, drives to the supermarket in front of the city center. Yeah, that's a question, so yeah. um, even if we order a lot, the, the basic ecological problem of e-commerce is not so much the driving, but the packaging. This is the, the, the big catastrophe at the moment. And we have to do something there to, to have reusable packaging. Uh, I don't think that, the, of course, we can always do better and, and reduce uh, the ecological footprint of the delivery stage of transportation. But the big problem of e-commerce nowadays is still packaging, I think. OK, thank you. OK, so thank you, Nils. It was truly really a very nice talk. Um... And I like the application area and the modernity of that. Uh, so I hope that it will trigger uh, further research uh, in this domain by many of our spectators. Thank you once more. And for the others, let me remind you that in two weeks, we will have a talk by Laurent Perron from Google France. Uh, and he will speak about a uh, well-known uh, SAT solver, uh, which is called CPSAT. Uh, which is uh, delivered as a part of OR tools by Google, okay? So he will speak, it's an open source software, so he will speak all about internals and how it's done and so on, okay? So stay tuned and hope to meet you in two weeks, okay? Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank bye -bye. you, bye.